Hello, my friends. Welcome to my channel, Lindy's Magpie Reads. This is a place where I talk about the books that I've been reading. And uh, today I'm also going to talk about readathons because September is the month of an art readathon called Framed in September that I am co hosting with Elizabeth of Bouquins and Books. Hannah of Hannah's Books, Heather Gregg, and Greg of Another Bibliophile Reads. I will link their channels down below and also more information about the readathon. It's straightforward. Read something related to art, experience some art, and bonus prompt, create something. So go ahead and stretch yourself. Uh, one thing that I have been creating lately is I've been knitting a hat and I'm about halfway through. I will pop in a photo and speaking of popping in, here's my cat Frida to come say hello. Are you going to look? No. All right. Uh, and if you think you're not somebody who creates things, maybe you need to think again. Cooking can be such a creative outlet. Uh, I made a cake lately for a friend's birthday. It was just a plain yellow cake with lots of fresh blueberries in it. Uh, another thing that I like to do in the kitchen is to create ice cream flavors. And I've got three right now. One was inspired by a lavender and honey ice cream that I saw at an ice cream shop. So I created it with uh, a steeping lavender in cream and then straining it out and then flavoring it with some uh, Parfait Amour liqueur, which is uh, violet flavored. And, and I also put honey in it. And then another flavor that I made was using dried Omani limes. So again, I steeped the cream. Uh, this cat. I steeped the cream with uh, crushed dried limes overnight and then uh, strained out the lime bits. And I used um, a Grand Marnier liqueur to flavor it, and about a teaspoon of the liquid from some preserved lemons that I made, oh, I guess much earlier this year when lemons were in season. Um, and in, in the jar in the fridge, the salt and the lemon juice and everything forms this wonderful sort of sticky salty lemony liquid and that adds a nice touch to the ice cream as well and oh and the third kind of ice cream that i made was inspired by this kind of uh, candy from denmark called lacrids and it's uh, a licorice ball in the middle covered with chocolate and they're just yummy so yummy so i steeped the cream with anise seed and fennel seed and strained that out. And then I used a uh, Sambuca liqueur and also a bunch of cocoa. And I got this chocolate uh, licorice kind of ice cream that turned out pretty good. I'm quite happy with it. Okay, so on to the books. Oh, Frida. <laughs> Okay, starting with this picture book biography of Maya Angelou. It's written by Renee Watson and illustrated by Brian Collier. This is actually a reread for me. I wanted to participate in my friend Marilyn Maya Mendoza's uh, month long celebration of Maya Angelou. She called it Phenomenal Woman Readathon. So this was my my pick. Uh, 
It's aimed at an elementary school age audience, so age seven to 10, and also wonderful for adults. Ryan Collier's art is done with collage and, and gouache, and it's very striking. It also covers some very difficult aspects of Angelou's life, sexual abuse that she suffered as a child, uh, her mutism that followed, and yet it's done in a way that is entirely appropriate for the age group. It's written entirely in verse, and in this section, I'll read you just a bit. When Maya was seven years old, her mother's boyfriend hurt her body, hurt her soul. Don't tell nobody, he said. Don't say a word. Sometimes bad things happen. Sometimes darkness comes. And those last two lines are repeated uh, in that, on, on that poem. There's another really striking image. Her friendships with uh, James Baldwin and Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X are also mentioned in here and the assassinations of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. And again, handled in a very appropriate way for the age group. And it ends on such an inspiring note, talking about her presenting a poem at Bill Clinton's inauguration. She was the first woman and the black, first black woman to have this honor. And it ends with a timeline and more information in the author's note and in the illustrator's note. Wow. Highly recommend this. Another booktube event that's going on is uh, Shake Timber starting in the month of September. And I've already started my Shakespeare reading, which also fits for Framed in September because theater is part of art. I read The Bard and the Book, How the First Folio Saved the Plays of William Shakespeare from Oblivion. It's written by Anne Bosom and it's got um, spot illustrations by a Spanish artist, Marta Sevilla. It's also got uh, historical illustrations that's uh, London, and these marbled paper illustrations. So she writes about how it came to be that Shakespeare's plays are actually written down and we can access them today because in they weren't first written down until after he died. Well, there's his notes and there were um, things called rolls, uh, scrolls of paper that uh, the actors had just with their lines on them, but they weren't intended to be in books. And this whole idea of plays being written down instead of just being something that you heard when you went to see theater uh, is, it was a new thing. That was something I hadn't thought about before. Uh, she goes into a lot of detail about the whole printing press process, uh, the making of paper, uh, which was all handmade. The typesetting was all done by hand. There's lots of expressions that we use every day, like mind your P's and Q's, or we talk about uppercase and lowercase letters, and those come from printing. Uh, I am so interested in printing that I've been to two different printing museums, the one in Lyon in France and the one in Antwerp in Belgium. I've actually gone to the Antwerp Printing Museum twice. So interesting. I love it. And it was there that I first saw 
illuminated manuscripts on display. And at the end of this book, Anne writes about her experience of seeing an original edition of the folio, so Shakespeare's plays, and how afterwards she stepped outside and found that she was weeping from the emotion of it, the, the wonderment of it. And I could identify because that's how I reacted as well, seeing uh, these ancient books. It's so special. School Library Journal, by the way, recommends this for ages 10 to 15, and I recommend it for adults as well. I've got another Shakespeare-related book. This I listened to in audio, Shakespeare, The Man Who Pays the Rent. And it is actually a conversation between uh, Judi Dench and the actor and director Brendan O'Hay. And he initially conceived of this as uh, a record of Judi Dench's experience uh, acting in Shakespeare's plays. And, and that I'm so glad that they made a book out of it and it is great in audio. Now, uh, Judi Dench it only does some portions of the audiobook uh, where she's quoting Shakespeare. And then there's this long, about 45 minute uh, section at the end where we can hear her conversation with Brendan O'Hay. Uh, but there's an actor who performs the Judy Dench part, Barbara Flynn. And her voice really sounds a lot like Judy Dench's voice, and she has all the um, laughter, and you know, it sounds there's so much spontaneity in it. We learn that Judy Dench's eyesight is uh, pretty bad right now, so uh, she can't read anymore, but she's got all these lines from Shakespeare memorized. It's amazing, actually, her memory <laughs> is amazing and I found that what she had to say about Shakespeare and the plays the particular plays so it's divided into chapters where she talks about the plays that she has acted in and there's some other short chapters about things like the audience and working with different directors and so on and another Shakespeare related thing that they talk about it was actually Brendan who brought this up that Liverpool University did this experiment on the impact of Shakespeare's words on the brain. To test this, they use a line from King Lear. A father and a gracious aged man have you madded. And scans showed that the word madded fired off a lot of electrical activity in the brain. And when matted was swapped for the word enraged, which means the same thing, but it's one that we're all familiar with, there was very little brain activity. So he says that this proves that unusual words and phrases give us a jolt. And Judy's response is, that's why I don't think we should update the language. It always loses something the poetry and the fizz. But it also made me think about why I love to encounter unusual vocabulary or unusual word construction in the, the books that I read. That's, I just love that jolt to the brain that I get. They also talked about Shakespeare's contribution to the English language. Uh, there are so many words. I, I know it's, you know, somewhere around a thousand words that Shakespeare invented, and many of them that we use today. Words like bedroom and bandit and critic and lonely and gossip and rant, uh, monumental, countless, frugal, 
gloomy, laughable, radiance, majestic, lackluster, and phrases like it's Greek to me, heart of gold, elbow room, live long day, method in his madness, naked truth, good riddance, one fell swoop, uh, strange bedfellows, milk of human kindness, wear one's heart on one's sleeve, to thine own self be true, uh, fair play, catch a cold, the lady doth protest too much, Ugh, so much. So I'm really glad that I have the opportunity to go see some Shakespeare in September. I'm gonna attend three plays at the Stratford Festival in Ontario on the third week of September. So lucky. Next, I have another audiobook memoir, Rebel Girl by Kathleen Hanna. She's a feminist punk musician. She was the uh, lead singer of Bikini Kill and La Tigre and other bands. I didn't listen to those bands, uh, but she also talks about the music that inspired her. Uh, bands like Yaz. She listened to Upstairs at Eric on repeat, and so did I. And Joan Jett, I was a big fan of her as well. I didn't know that she trained as a domestic violence volunteer, um, answering the phones at a women's shelter. She had a lot of young women coming to her after the shows, that, after she performed, and she would uh, counsel them. And Kathleen Hanna herself experienced so much male violence, like starting when she was a little girl because her father was um, a major abusive. Yeah, you can hear all about that in her memoir, which uh, she reads the audiobook. It's, I think it's great to hear uh, an, an author read their own memoir. In a part where she talks about needing her high school guidance counselor to sign a form, an application, you know, she's applying for college. She says, he talked mostly about his own sex life to her and he said, Teenagers didn't appreciate how great they had it sex-wise. And he also told her that instead of applying for college, she'd be better off marrying a man with a good job. And then this guy would be able to uh, uh, buy her a convertible and she'd look really cute driving around in a convertible. So Hannah pushed him to sign this form and, you know, the next thing he said was, you know, you're really not college material. It's just not in the stars for you. Uh, I was glad that uh, later on, Hannah filed a complaint about him and the kinds of things that he said. Yeah. She talks about coming up with the term girl power and how that came about. Her insights into herself as a young woman, as a musician, uh, battling the very sexist uh, environment of the music world, uh, the mistakes that she made having to do with um, trying to be uh, anti-racist and including black women in feminism, uh, and uh, yeah, M making mistakes and admitting that all of it, I just found it so engaging, so interesting. And I, I was surprised how much I liked it. Next up is another audiobook, a, a novel this time. It's called Mobility and it's by Lydia Kiesling. The audiobook is read by Kelly Tager, and I can't remember where I heard about it. I had it on my TBR, but then Sarah of Roadworthy talked about it recently. And uh, the fact that it starts out in Baku, Azerbaijan, which you can see on the 
cover of the book, The, the Flame Towers. Uh, it starts in 1998, so before those towers were built. Ugh, I can't remember the main character's name, but we meet her when she's about 14 years old. Her father is in the diplomatic service, so that's why she's in Baku. We follow her life all the way up actually into the future, something like 2050. But most of it is set in the 21st century. And she she's a character who's kind of oblivious to larger things going on in the world. So she's not particularly sympathetic. And yet I found her really interesting in her kind of shallow preoccupation with clothes and appearance and uh, kind of being lost as far as, uh, you know, what kind of job she was interested in. And actually there is a lot about work in here and how um, a lot of us, our work is simply what we have to do to get money. And, you know, the day-to-day -day interactions with colleagues, uh, she's doing administrative type work, uh, typing, computer work, filing. Um, what she discovers that she's good at is editing the writing of the engineers and these other men. Uh, she ends up working in the, the field of oil and gas development. And the larger theme of geopolitics and the effect of oil and gas on our environment and climate change is there without her really noticing until she gets older. And I have to say that this book grew on me after I finished reading it. I just kept liking it more and more. Um, that Yeah, one of those kind of books. Next. I have Code Dependent, Living in the Shadow of AI. It's by uh, Madhumita Murgia. And whoa, this one made a huge impact on me. It was shortlisted for the Women's Prize for nonfiction. That's why I picked it up. So glad that I did. But oh, there is some scary stuff in here lots of different aspects of artificial intelligence and you know how it affects all of us in our daily lives and how it will affect us even more in the future. The author has uh, written for many years for Wired magazine. She's a British author. Probably the section that horrified me the most is the chapter called Your Body and she talks about deep fakes and how hundreds of thousands of women around the world have had this happen to them where their image has been used in pornography against you know their even their knowledge and uh, uh, i could just feel how a, a terrible it is for someone to you know, see these uh, porno videos where it looks like it's them participating. Oh, oh, and it's not illegal. It's, and so, you know, they couldn't do anything about it. I mean, we still can't do anything about it. A few countries are starting to make it against the law. Um, Australia is one of them. But in the case of a, of a woman who is a, a lawyer who is trying to bring attention to this and, and how we need more regulation, uh, you know, the more she talked about it, the more uh, this type of imagery with her face in was appearing. And if it was done on a server that wasn't in Australia, then there was nothing she could do about it. 
Oh, and, 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 and the magnitude of this, oh, it's so distressing, so distressing. Wow. Anyway, I, I would say probably the most encouraging use of artificial intelligence is in the field of medicine, but even there, there are so many problems with um, bias on the part of the data that's used to create these AI uh, tools. Anyway, this is a really important topic and this is a fabulous book, so I do recommend it. I cannot do this with a cat crawling all over me. Next up is another great collection of essays, Dispersals uh, on Plants, Borders, and Belonging. And it's by Jessica J. Lee, who is a British, Canadian, Taiwanese author. Her first book was called Two Trees Make a Forest, and it was great as well. This one is on the subject of plants and how humans have moved plants on purpose and sometimes accidentally to different parts of the world and then how uh, often those plants end up being a problem in their new place. And the author having a history of immigration in her personal background points out how the language that we use to talk about invasive plants is drawing on the attitudes that we have about people who immigrate and move around to different parts of the world. Uh, she also talks about how uh, the history of plant exploration and adventuring in general, like climbing Mount Everest, focuses on um, individuals, almost always white male individuals, and ignores all of the helpers, the assistants, the local guides who made that type of uh, exploratory journey uh, possible. Yeah, who writes these histories? That's the question always to be aware of. In the section that she has about seaweeds, there's a, a, a marked difference there uh, because a lot of women were involved. And it's interesting that I recently read a whole book about seaweed. Um, can't think who the author is just at this moment, a Dutch author. I will put the title in here when I'm editing this. She says, despite the tendency within botanical societies to sideline women's scientific contributions, seaweeds are an area in which women saw unusual success. And she names these different women who were pioneers of the study of algae in the 19th century. And she also talks about Anna Atkins, who in the 1840s created these cyanotypes of seaweeds. They were published as an illustrated guide, considered the first book illustrated with photographic images, not just by a woman, but by anyone. And it merged art and science in a historic record of seaweeds on the Kent shore. Uh, this sent me down an internet rabbit hole, looking at those images, which are also mentioned in the seaweed book that I talked about. Anyway, I very much enjoyed uh, dispersals. I've got two more books to tell you about. The Boy Lost in the Maze by Joseph Colo, with illustrations by uh, Kate Milner. This is a novel in verse and it has these great uh, illustrations that, all, that add quite a bit to the story, which is got sort of two timelines in it. 
there's a boy named Theo in contemporary London, England, and also uh, Theseus from Greek mythology. Uh, he's on a journey looking for his father, and that's what's happening with Theo in contemporary London as well. Uh, Theo is living with his white mother, and his father was black, so he's biracial, and he decides to go and find his father, track him down when he's 17 years old. The, the ties between uh, ancient Greece and modern day are done so well. And there's a few sections where there's kind of a choose your own adventure aspect as well. Uh, this was so engaging. My YA book club um, discussed this recently and we were all full, full, full of praise for it. It's extremely well done. Joseph Kulo was actually the uh, UK Children's Laureate. Uh, I think he is still this year. Yeah, it says 2022 to 2024, right here on the cover. Now, the um, this is the North American cover. The UK cover is almost the same, but the color is different. There's a lot of pink and it's it's just lighter. I don't know if in North America they thought that teens or especially boys wouldn't pick this up if there was too much pink, but this is definitely a book that will engage young readers uh, age probably 14 and up and adults too. Yeah, <laughs> it's really good. My final book is another memoir, The Endless Step, Growing Up in Siberia. It's by Esther Haustig. This was first published in 1968. So a true story, the author's uh, family is Jewish. And when she was 10 years old in uh, Vilna in Poland, or what was Poland at the time, I think it's now in Lithuania, uh, soldiers came to their house and sent them off to Siberia for the crime of being capitalists. And in a way, they were lucky because this happened before the Nazis had a chance to send them off to con concentration camps to be killed, which is what happened to almost all of the other members of their extended family. So the story or the memoir is a record of the five years that their family spent in Siberia in extreme hardship, starting out working in a mine there. And there is also a lot of hope in this book. And I don't know why it's not as well known as Anne Frank's diary. It certainly makes a really good pairing. Uh, it is suitable for age 10 and up. The audiobook that I listened to was read by Alyssa Bresnahan, and it was recorded in 1995. And they've left in all of the outro st stuff at the end of the, you know, the recorded books. Thank you for listening to recorded books. It's very old fashioned. I'm actually going to include that last little tiny clip at the end of this video if you want to hang in there for, I don't know, 15 seconds of tape. I, I think I'll put in a little bit from the Butchart Gardens as well, give you something pretty to look at. And I want to thank you so much for watching this video. Thanks for being there. Thanks for saying hello in the comments down below. I always love to hear from you. So happy reading, everybody. Bye for now. So to order another recorded book or for a copy of our latest listing, please call us using the toll-free number found on the back of the book.
You can order by phone with any major credit card or by writing to us or by faxing us. Don't forget to ask about easy 30-day rentals by mail. 